So now we'll open our first session, Epidemiology and Public Health, and a special thanks to Misha Chetkov and Sean Trula for volunteering to serve as co-moderators. They'll help uh, guide the discussion after the lightning talks. Our first presenter is Wei Wang. I am Wei Wang from UCLA. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, to introduce our RAPTI project on dynamic graph neural networks for modeling and monitoring COVID-19 pandemic. In this project, uh, we want to leverage social media as one of the possible data sources to serve as what we call the social sensor, because uh, now, and since uh, almost two years ago, uh, we can observe that on social media, there's a very active dis uh, actually uh, discussions and also information propagated along Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, you name it, right? All the social media and things. So we think that those are very valuable sources to gather information, especially to understand uh, what is happening at a like, local level, like in the city or in, in a geographical region. So we hope this information to help us to further improve the prediction of the uh, um, pandemic trend. So to accomplish this, um, we actually pick two specific questions we want to answer. So it's a how much or whether or how uh, this can help us to uh, improve the short-term and long-term forecast. Short-term we mean like maybe seven days, long-term maybe 20, 28 days. And also can this help us to identify potential risk factors and event uh, that is happening uh, locally that may contribute to the um, uh, local <clears throat> pandemic uh, statistics. So what we are doing is that we build a gigantic dynamic uh, graph neural network. So in this graph neural network, each uh, geographical location like a state in this uh, figure, uh, we could do at the county level as well. So as uh, it's converted to a node and uh, this node actually has become a series of nodes along the time dimension. So between this uh, geographical, we call it location nodes, and then we uh, connect them by the uh, mobility data between, let's see, in this case, different states. So basically on, on a daily basis, how many people transport from one state to another state. We also extract event from social media and data, and then connect those events, and then the event and their relationship from social media and data, and then connect them uh, with, uh, edges, construct a knowledge graph from the social media and data. And we connect this knowledge graph to the appropriate time and location that we extracted. So once we have this, we train a neural network, a graph neural network architecture. It's a dynamic graph neural network architecture. And on top of that, we use uh, actually so neural ODE functions to do the prediction of the daily new cases and also the daily death statistics. So on the lower part, I just show some comparison like the ground truth versus the prediction uh, in California. In this journey, so what we discovered is that actually indeed with the social media data, we can demonstrate that, uh, we, that the model can predict a, a higher accuracy than with, I mean, the model we saw the social media and data. So we, in our paper, we explicitly compare against the, uh, the bully board published by CDC, those the top few models. And we demonstrated that we can uh, make a more accurate prediction. And also we can discover um, a pandemic relevant event and recent major risk factors. Uh, sometimes it's this uh, lockdown policy that actually helped to prevent the spread. Sometimes like lately it's like, for example, vaccination. And earlier days, maybe there's a uh, um, Los Angeles marathon that, that was happened at the very beginning of the pandemic. So those events we were able to identify. Um, the uh, challenge would be like social media data is very noisy and uh, contains lots of bias. So we spend quite a lot of time to do the denoisy and the de-bias. Computational challenge, this was another question, is that uh, actually the model is very computationally heavy. So we use the NVIDIA's uh, GPU server to train this. Looking forward, I hope that, you know, I can uh, have the opportunity to collaborate more 
uh, with more public health experts uh, to help evaluate and fine tune our model. And I hope uh, that uh, there will be more mechanism support to enable long-term interdisciplinary collaboration uh, like this. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Bahar. I'm from uh, I'm PhD student at George Mason University, and I'm working with uh, under the supervision of Dr. Alice Miller Hooks, who is the PI for this project. And today I'll talk about models for assessing strategies for hospitals and responding to COVID-19 and other pandemics. Okay, so uh, the goals um, in this project is to design a mathematical model uh, to support hospitals and regional administrators administrators to respond to COVID-19 pandemic and other outbreaks. So we want, to, with our work, we want to provide insights for action to help hospitals adapt and coordinate to meet demand surges as new waves arise. This relies on this great event simulation uh, framework where we want to measure evolving hospital response capacity and capability. We want to identify how best to increase capacity uh, through crisis standards of care, modified operations, and in case of hotspot, designating all resources to pandemic patients. Uh, we want to be able to uh, evaluate collaboration strategies for strong regional response. We want to estimate and prioritize critical supply needs. Uh, we want to forecast switch points to and from hotspot design as surge ebbs and flow. And finally, we want to be able to quantify the values of flattening the curve. Uh, so this work uh, relies on open queuing network conceptualization with closed loops and parallel processing. Queuing systems are defined by their customer servers and service discipline. Here uh, in our model, customers are patients with priority servers or hospital units and the discipline is time dependent priority queues. Uh, this is a discrete event stochastic simulation framework. It's developed in, in, developed in extensive software, which is a, a simulation software. It include, includes uncertainty and variability in patient arrival, service times, uh, length of stay, needed resources and survival and likelihood and mortality. So it's a patient-based uh, resource constraint uh, frame uh, like simulation, discrete event simulation framework. Uh, it replicates a generic 200 urban tertiary hospital. Uh, it has 12 critical units. Before the pandemic, um, we only had 10 critical units, but we added isolation rooms and uh, critical decision units uh, to incorporate the COVID-19 pandemic care path. Okay, so we want to come up, come up with uh, insights for action. We have four uh, different surge levels. Uh, the getting ready is the pre-pandemic where there was no COVID-19 patient arrival. The initial onset is where we have few COVID-19 patient arrivals. As we move on and have more patient uh, COVID-19 patient arrival, we have the outbreak level. And hotspot is uh, where hospitals are overwhelmed with COVID-19 patient arrival. So we want to come up with insights for actions for all of these. Yeah, these are uh, some of the examples of insights that we found. Uh, for example, uh, by forming a coalition and implementing capacity enhancement strategies, hospitals will be able to serve more patients. We found that by dedicating some of the resources from ED and IGW emergency, emergency department and internal general wards to create a COVID-19 care path, uh, hospitals will lose some of their uh, capacity to serve routine patients, but they, own, they can serve up to 75% of routine um, emergency patients. We found that canceling elective surgeries in and times of pandemic can help hospitals to recoup the losses in treating the routine patients. And we found that by dedicating all of the resources to pandemic patients and creating a COVID-19 designated hospital, uh, we, we can be able to uh, see an increase of 500% in the number of COVID-19 pa patients served. We found two key switch points where hospitals can modify their operations and uh, increase their capacity. One of them is implementing alternative standards of care, and the other one is uh, creating a COVID-19 designated care facility. And uh, the last one is flattening the curve, where we found that the higher the acceleration in pandemic patient demand growth, the greater the impact of the intervention. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we are working on right now is we're working with Mount Sinai and Columbia University. We are gathering information to validate the results that we have from this uh, simulation work, uh, which is right now uh, we're working on getting and gathering data from them. Um, yeah, that, that was all. Thank you so much for the opportunity to show our results and to ask for cooperation in this research. We started to work on. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection pretty soon, and we redirected our activity with helium ion microscopy from biomaterials to the study of the infection. 
At the beginning, we partner with the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and then with the Public Health Research Institute in Newark. This kind of microscope is not uh, yet well diffused. Few institutions in the United States, public institutions, got this facility. It has a lot of advantages. One is that it doesn't use electroconductive coating. So when you study something at the nanoscale, you basically have its true morphology, and you don't have the kind of a shadow that uh, the electroconductive coating cast uh, gives to you. So we were able also to make a relative microscopy because with helium ion, you have very low bleaching of the fluorochromes. And we were able to analyze the cultures of Vero E6 cells infected by the virus with a very high detail. So basically we discovered that uh, during the infection, the cells develop some structure that may allow them to have an alternative route to the famous route that we all know. So there is the extracytoplasmic route where the virus, these red dots, uh, dock to the uh, membrane of the cell, enter the cell, replicates, exit the cells, and infected other cells. But actually, the cells can develop a way to infect each other without any variance going outside. This may be some implication. <clears throat> Basically, the cells adopt uh, the fusion mechanism. So there is a lot of cell fusion with this virus, which was not present with the SARS-1. Then they develop this structure, the tunnel in nanotubes, that uh, is a kind of uh, the key finding of our research. And also they continue to produce a lot of extracellular vesicles, which are not pathologic structures, but actually are a mean of intracytoplasmic transmission of everything. And uh, only the first event, the fusion can be seen with optical microscopy. So pathologists have reported on that, but the other have been completely overlooked. This free feature can configure a fully intracytoplasmic route of transmission. And that means that this transmission cannot be blocked by antibodies because there is no virus outside. So if the patient is vaccinated and you have a good immune system, probably the virus will take this other route and maybe in breakthrough infection and reinfection that we are seeing now, this is the explanation. Another strong and direct evidence is that both three mechanisms, fusion, TNT and EVs, can be blocked by drugs. And some of these drugs have been empirically tested and they show their efficacy. So we are actually seeking collaboration to characterize better this tunnel in nanotube and testing existing or even new drugs on this route. We are quite happy with what rabbits allow us to achieve. Uh, I think we found a, a new mechanism. We, we got already a paper in preprinting scientific report, we already presented at meetings, but I think we were quite naive. We were not able up to now to find the progress, the continuation for this research. And of course, we, we want to find support to better characterize this route. And as I said, characterize drug against this route. Certainly, probably we need help in the field of molecular biology or pharmacology and pathology. And uh, I would say it's probably our fault, but uh, I would suggest that being awarded a rapid and then uh, let's say uh, being close to the end, uh, our rapid will end in April and not having a clear way to continue the research, it's a bit uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Hi, I'm Sean Trulove. I'm at Johns Hopkins University in the Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I am presenting on our project focusing on projecting possible scenarios of COVID-19 in the United States. Um, and this is both work from our own team to build and produce our model, as well as to coordinate what we call the COVID-19 scenario modeling hub. And so the idea of this hub kind of came out of the lack of focus in the longer term projections uh, during the pandemic, there has been a lot of work to consolidate model projections for forecasts during this pandemic uh, up to last December. 
through the COVID-19 forecast hub. And we, re we really wanted to allow for a platform to uh, integrate multiple projections from different teams in a longer time scale, because there were a lot of questions at that time about, you know, what's the, the longer term outlook of the pandemic going to be with things like vaccination, changing NPIs, changing variants and things happening rapidly. Uh, and so we took the approach of the multi-model combination, producing what we call, or what's called an ensemble model. And the idea here is really to capture the uncertainty, uh, which there's a tremendous amount of with projecting this far into the future, but capture that uncertainty that comes from the unknowns about the future in terms of, you know, the, the biology, the behavior, things like that through our scenarios, as well as the uncertainty that is uh, provided by different model structures, different expertise, different assumptions and things that comes from combining multiple scientists and experts into this process. And so we've been extremely fortunate to have really wonderful teams contributing to the Scenario Modeling Hub during the past almost year. Several are on this call today, so thanks to you all for uh, really making this thing possible. But this gives you a picture quickly of uh, you know, what these projections look like with multiple colored lines in this figure on the right demonstrating the different projections from different teams and those all combining in to give us a sense of the potential for the future. We've had 10 rounds so far, uh, and these rounds have really tried to focus on very timely and important questions that are, are unknown. Uh, and those questions have changed throughout the process of this um, as the pandemic has changed. You know, looking at things like vaccine supply, non-pharmaceutical interventions and changing behavior and control in the United States, changing variants, starting with the alpha variants, then Delta, and of course now Omicron, changing hesitancy and saturation of vaccination coverage, questions around immunity waning, and implementing vaccination in new age groups. So we've had a lot of success. Um, like I said, we've had 10, 10 great teams, 10 rounds. We've produced three papers uh, out of this, multiple contributions to very high level decisions within the Centers for Disease Control and White House. This has been, as many of you know, a very challenging process because uh, this virus continues to really challenge us in being able to predict what it's going to do. We're always looking for more teams to contribute to the, the Scenario Hub. And we are hoping to expand this work to other pathogens. So if there are interested individuals, you know, feel free to reach out. And hoping that this platform can become a sustained capacity that we can use for influenza, for other emerging outbreaks, and then be able to rapidly deploy it in our next uh, pandemic. Challenges and needs from agencies, from NSF, you know, as everyone says, we, we always need funding and support, especially in the peacetime when uh, things, not, things aren't always just an emergency uh, for building that long-term capacity. So again, thank you to our teams who have contributed so much. Please check out COVID-19ScenarioModelingHub.org if you have not already to get some, uh, some look at our projections. Thanks. My name is Peter Leonardi. I'm the CEO and founder of OmniSite. And our rapid program was the rapid development of a protein vaccine for COVID-19. My background is I've worked in many areas in biotech. Our um, project was led by myself and Mino Cox, who was the CEO of Protein Sciences, which developed the first recombinant seasonal flu vaccine and Ed Quinlan, who's our lead immunologist, who came to us from um, Liping, uh, Liping Chen's lab at Yale. And Liping Chen is one of the fathers of modern immuno-oncology. Um, our project was to take our platform technology, which we use to um, develop therapeutics against cancer um, and adapt it or attempt to adapt it to be a COVID-19 vaccine. This, is, this diagram shows our platform. It's made up of two components. 
um, it's a protein made up of two components. One, the blue area you see, which binds to um, the immune system cells, such as dendritic cells, and activates the immune system, and the orange domain, which targets the immune response. Previously, our uh, platform was used and had a cancer targeting domain. So the idea in this project was to remove the cancer targeting domain and put a um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, targeting domain and activate the immune system towards the COVID-19 uh, producing virus. At first, we didn't know if this in, had questions of whether it would work or not because our technology is designed to activate a T cell response against uh, tumors. So here we, you can see the results, the most important results um, in the top chart where we looked at the antibody response. We did not know if we would be able to create an antibody response to the, um, the virus. And you could see in this uh, a dose dependent response of um, antibody tire titers, the black to the blue to the green. And you could see as the, um, as the concentration goes up, the antibody response goes up. But more strikingly, you can see in the last set of um, the red data, uh, where we used a small, uh, smaller dose, yet we used two vaccinations. You can see a very robust response, uh, antibody response to the uh, virus. And additionally, in the lower two panels, as we expected, you, you'd still see a T cell response, which we found, which was shown to be very important in recovering patients uh, from COVID-19. So roadmap, our initial difficulties were in developing this new construct. We got over that um, pretty quickly, and now we can use that information to quickly re-engineer our um, platform to address many different pathogens. The uh, results were enormously promising, and it's a very strong proof of concept for efficacy and safety. So needs are um, to find a partner to, we did a very, um, successful proof of concept project and now we need to roll this out to much larger we need a larger partners to roll this out our observations about the process we, we found that the way the nsf um, deals with grants was very um I, I work with the nci i'm on a um a sbir review panel there and we found i found that the nsf was much much quicker in the way that it reviews grants and submissions. And we think this is super important, particularly for things like COVID, where a response is critically and, and time is of the essence. So we think that it can be approved some, but we found the NSF to be quicker than most of the other government agencies. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Hi everyone, um, so my name is Sharika Hete. Uh, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the work we've been doing over at Northwestern. So this rapid grant is titled Tracking and Deconstructing the COVID-19 Vaccine Distribution as an Extreme Logistics Event. And it was done in collaboration with Professor Hani Manasani and Professor Karen Smilowitz at Northwestern. Um, so the vision for the project was to document in real time the state of the vaccine supply chain and track vaccination rates over time to get some insights into the design and operation of future extreme logistic deployment and also to develop a framework for evaluating the rollout that's kind of sensitive to the supply side and demand side constraints that we saw in the US. Um, so we were primarily looking at tracking the vaccine distribution, and so we developed an online real-time web portal to monitor the rollout, which is called the NUTC Vaccine Logistics Dashboard, and it's available at the link at the bottom of the screen. Um, so what this dash, this is what the dashboard looks like. Um, it pulls in data from daily from the CDC and from various state departments of health to kind of update the graphics and stats, um, and there's a bunch of other info and on, on the different tabs at different jurisdiction levels as well, including uh, CDC hesitancy estimations. So using the data that was kind of compiled and displayed in the dashboards, here is some of the insights that we we're able to kind of pull out. So in figure one, we're kind of looking at the start of the Delta surge on August 13th. So on the x-axis, we have vaccination rate versus the seven day average daily new cases per 100,000 people. So you can actually see that like the four least vaccinated states on the left. So that would be Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana. They had like an average case rate of 96.8 versus the four most highly vaccinated states at the time, which were Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, and Connecticut had a case rate of only 14.9 at the same for the same week. 
Um, so the four least vaccinated states we're seeing almost six and a half times the COVID case rate of the most vaccinated states. So that's kind of tracking the vaccination rates over time as a proxy for understanding the supply chain. So we're kind of developing a framework to understand and assess the supply chain as a whole. And so we broadly are kind of looking at these two different regimes in the rollout. Um, so there's an initial period when the demand for vaccines is exceeding the supply, um, followed by a period that's constrained by vaccine hesitancy. So figure two is kind of showing the number of doses administered in the yellow curve um, and distributed as the orange curve in the US. Um, and the green line is a characteristic slope of the first regimes where supply constrained and the red line is a characteristic slope of the hesitancy constrained re regime, similar to a queuing model. So we can kind of extract this framework out at different jurisdiction levels. So figure three is actually showing it at a county level. So we have it for Cook County, DeKalb County, Georgia, Los Angeles County, and Miami-Dade County. And kind of looking at these characteristic slopes can help us figure out how the supply chain is performing differently in these different areas. Because we don't have intermediate supply chain data, which isn't publicly available, um, this sort of multi-regime framework is useful because it does provide insights into a complex system where we only know the vaccination outcomes at one terminal. So the framework kind of able to capture those unique dynamics as the extreme demand is initially underserved due to capacity constraints, and then that's followed by demand side issues um, related to hesitancy in the US. So now we're kind of using these extracted slopes to understand how the supply chain varies across the country and to find out where we might have last mile issues or bottlenecks and how that varies by region or politics and demographics and which of those differ significantly from the national models and the national averages. Um, we also kind of see in the supply constrained regime that the delivered doses curve is much higher. It's still higher even in the supply constrained regime. So that might be indicating last mile issues and not full transportation issues um, across the supply chain. So what has gone well and what has not? Vaccination data is very easy to find at the federal, state, county level. And that's been, that's gone well, but it's much harder to find public data on the specific movement of vaccine shipments and actually have the full picture of the end to end of the supply chain. So we can't really see where the bottlenecks are specifically um, in terms of shipments and can't really do that sort of optimization analysis. But this framework is kind of allowing us to determine where there might be potential bottlenecks and kind of we can zone in on those. And some of the remaining challenges are kind of looking at how do we extract lessons from this because we do know that the capacity to vaccinate is varying significantly across the country. And whether that was in that regime one where it's a supply constrained issue or in regime two, which is hesitancy kind of varies from each part of the country. Um, and so an individual approach would kind of need to be taken to develop a more equitable supply chain across the nation. Um, yeah, and that's an extremely brief overview of some of the insights we found so far and we're still working on. Thank you. So our project focused on the development and application of a polydimethylsiloxane or PDMS based passive air sampler that aimed to assess personal exposure to SARS-CoV-2. This project was a collaborative effort between the School of Public Health, the School of Medicine, and the Environmental Engineering Department at Yale University. Our principal investigator is Dr. Crystal Pollitt, um, including the co-investigator of Jordan Petchy. So we focused on using passive sampling methods, which are less cumbersome compared to active sampling methods and have no electronic parts, which increases the deployment ability of these samplers. The PDMS-based sampler known as the Fresh Air Clip was worn on the shirt collar of participants to simulate the breathing zone of individuals. We were able to obtain results from 62 participants across Connecticut and have since expanded to other participants and people. This work can be described in a manuscript, which is currently in review. So to be able to convert from the detection in viral loading on the sampler to volumetric concentration in RNA copies per cubic meter to better assess risk, we first needed to determine the rate of viral aerosol uptake onto the sampler collection material, PDMS. So we used Phi-6 as a surrogate for SARS-CoV-2 in laboratory experiments owing to its similar physiological characteristics and lower biosafety level requirements for aerosolization. These experiments were conducted in a custom fabricated rotating drum to maintain suspension of aerosolized particles. So while other studies 
on passive samplers in the literature reported uptake rates under differing conditions, collection materials, and for different aerosol species studied. Here we applied a viral surrogate for SARS-CoV-2 known as the bacteriophage Phi-6 to determine the uptake rate by PDMS for use in passive air sampling. Five out of our 62 fresh air clips studied were positive for SARS-CoV-2 and using the previously described uptake rate, we were able to determine the airborne virus concentrations. These concentrations for positive samples range from five to 140 RNA copies of SARS-CoV-2 per cubic meter of air. You can see that four out of the five positive samples came from restaurant settings, which can likely be explained by the lack of masks which needed to be worn while patrons were seated at a restaurant. In addition, the healthcare worker sampling area, which took place in hospitals, reports no positive samples for SARS-CoV-2, likely owing to the high air exchange rates, personal protective equipment requirement, and strict cleaning protocols in such hospitals. While our levels of passive sampling detection of SARS-CoV-2 in the air were comparable to those levels de detected by active sampling reported in the literature in patient areas and medical staffed areas of hospitals, our levels detected were significantly lower than those levels by detected by active sampling methods in infected patient areas within a hospital. So we were able to demonstrate the use of a PDMS-based passive air sampler to serve as a semi-quantitative tool to assess personal exposure to SARS-CoV-2 among indoor environments. And ultimately, if we increase the sample size, this can ideally be expanded to understand exposure levels um, and evaluate transmission risk, as well as be used to guide the implementation of prevention and control strategies for respiratory viruses among indoor environments. Future research and areas for potential collaboration first include the expanding of this assessment to incorporate other respiratory viruses, as well as predominantly increasing the sample size use of the fresh air clip, mostly um, in high risk areas such as schools, which were not previously studied. Um, we have already studied such use of the fresh air clip in healthcare facilities, but would love to expand our deployment and particularly among areas with low vaccination rates, which may be of particular interest. Okay, in that case, Sean, we have six minutes for discussion. All right, <laughs> let's fly through these. I think a lot of the questions have been answered on chat, but um, I'll start with uh, Wei. So I'm curious with the social media using that for forecasting, you know, one of the things that we've, we've all found throughout this pandemic is that diseases are hard to predict when it's really the population and behavior dynamics that are what's causing the directions and the shifts that we go. Like, are there certain ways that the social media has been able to, in a very timely manner, enable you to predict better in these forecasts? And, and how, what's the time scale of that improvement? Our time scale is on the daily basis, and uh, we do not just use social media data. We use social media data together with all the other data that traditional epidemiology is used. So like we look at the daily uh, case number, death number, you know, new uh, I think uh, hospitalization, and the lately like vaccination number, and also we use mobility data together. Uh, like uh, we have the daily mo mobility data from one zip code to another zip code, so we. So we use a lot of data. Social media and data is just uh, one part of the data we're using. But, and have you have been able to, in, a, in real time, been able to use these data or are there, is it kind of retrospective? So, well, it's uh, not, um, it, it will take like a, a day or so to process the data. So, so basically we can, maybe right now we can use the data up until uh, let's say Monday, <laughs> and then to to make a forecast, maybe you know a, a week down the road. So, um, okay. So we'll, there's a question in the chat for Daryl. Are there different ventilation systems accounted for in the fresh clip work? Um, yes, thank you. I think I can answer on behalf of Dr. Pollitt, unless she has anything to add. We didn't 
incorporate different ventilation systems when sampling. In comparison, we used a homeless shelter and restaurant facilities, and then also a hospital. Um, and so we can see that there was not detection of SARS-CoV-2 present on the passive samplers deployed in the hospital, which can be a factor of increased ventilation rates as well as other prevention and control strategies. And this can certainly shed light on the effectiveness of these ventilation strategies. However, we would certainly need to control for all factors in such a study like mask mandates, et cetera. With your your dashboard about hesitancy and capacity constrained rates of vaccination, do you see this, you know, the new information about Omicron coming out? Are you starting to see signals about boosters increasing or uh, maybe uptake increasing because of the concerns? Um, so I haven't looked specifically at recent enough data to know that, but at least from the Delta surge, we did start seeing an increase. So you actually see the curve kind of going up in the supply constraint and then it levels off at this uh, hesitancy constraint. And then at, once Delta started, we actually did see an uptake in vac vaccination rates again. And so we've only highlighted these two regimes, but I think the framework is supposed to be more of a multi-regime where you're kind of looking at how this supply chain is evolving over time. And, and I suppose you can probably track boosters uh, with that as well as potentially the, the modified vaccines that Pfizer and Moderna plan to put out. Yeah, I think we, you can start drawing like separate curbs for all of those as well and kind of take out the, the, the different regimes from that. Yeah. Very cool. All right, looks okay. like we got to move on. Thanks so much. Thank you.